Thank you all. Wow, it's been a great collection of um, presentations and, and talks this morning. And um, I wish you hadn't mentioned innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm going to have to speak with Bill Hellman afterwards. I didn't know they were dirty words when we named our program at the Thayer School. <laughs> we still think it's a good thing. Um, what a perfect way to follow on the last speaker. Right. Show of hands, who knows who this is? All right. Good, good. Now another show of hands. How many of you watched, or if you're like me, afterwards read the transcript of the State of the Union address about six weeks ago? Great, good turnout. Well, I hope you paid attention to a few words in the middle of the president's speech, words that may not have resonated with you quite the way they resonated with me and some of my colleagues, but words that we found to be very, very important. He talked about this being our generation's Sputnik moment. Now, in making that, that comment, in drawing reference to Sputnik, what was he doing? Well, he was reminding us of a challenge that the United States and the world, but a challenge that the United States in particular faced a little bit more than 50 years ago, a challenge that was precipitated by the launch of the, so of the Soviet satellite Sputnik. How many of you have seen this picture before? Okay. Wow, not as many as have seen the president, but, but still a fair number. This is actually not the actual Sputnik satellite. This is a reproduction. It's a model that's housed in the, in the um, Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Now, in the late 1950s, at the time that this took place, the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a competition to launch the first Earth-orbiting artificial satellite. The middle of 1957 through 1958 had been designated by the scientific community as the International Geophysical Year. So a group of scientists got together and said, wouldn't it be great if we could launch artificial satellites into Earth orbit that could probe the inner reaches of the at or the outer reaches of the atmosphere, the inner reaches of outer space, and tell us something about the near Earth environment by orbiting scientific instruments. Well, the United States and the Soviet Union had their best scientists and engineers working on this, but in October 1957, the Soviet Union got there first. Now, communications back in the 50s weren't quite as instantaneous as they, were, as they are today. Of course, there was no email, there was no internet, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there were no cell phones, there were no cell phone cameras. And so the United States didn't have significant advance warning that this was happening. In fact, this caught us quite a bit by surprise. Sputnik wasn't much to look at. 23 inches in diameter, NASA says, about the size of a beach ball. And if you see the replica at air at space, that's about how big it was. 184 pounds, a little bit bigger than me, but not all that heavy. And it orbited the Earth once every 98 minutes for the three months that it was in space before its orbit degraded and it burned up in the atmosphere in early 1958. Now, what Sputnik carried were some very basic scientific instruments, temperature probes to measure the temperature um, uh, profile of um, the outer regions of the atmosphere, some other scientific instrumentation, but it also had a small radio transmitter that just emitted a beep, beep, beep as Sputnik orbited the Earth, giving out a signal that could be tracked not just by large-scale radio stations, but by amateur radio operators, ham radio operators around the world. It's hard to understand in this day and age what a significant impact this had on the scientific and engineering community and on the political community in the United States. The reaction here was that we needed to act. We needed to do something to counter this tremendous accomplishment of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, and catch up. So in October 1957, with the launch of Sputnik, the United States officials in the government who had been responsible for disparate um, oversight of different programs in rocketry and, and um, the development of technology to, to uh, enter space, developed the infrastructure necessary to do this in a seamless way. Within one year, they combined various functions from different agencies and created NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and they combined research that was related to defense into a new agency that they called ARPA, the Advanced Research and Projects Agency, which has since been renamed DARPA. Now, if any of you have ever had any dealings with the government, think about this. Within less than one year, two brand new agencies, mission-focused agencies, were created, funded, and put to work. In addition to providing the necessary infrastructure, we provided significant investment, research funding in science and engineering to help drive this enterprise and develop the technology needed to ultimately 
put not just satellites, but put humans in space, put man in space, and land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the end of the next decade. Another pillar of this three-pronged approach was education, right? So I want you to remember this, three things that were necessary to meet this challenge. Investment, infrastructure, and education. Although no one called it STEM back in the 1950s, STEM, the acronym meaning science, technology, engineering, and math, there was a tremendous focus on educating the next generation of scientists and engineers, principally engineers who could develop the technology to meet this significant challenge. The research funding was in place, the infrastructure was in place, but what's interesting is if you go back and look at how the educational system responded, how scientists and, and, and engineers in universities help educate new generations of engineers, you see that in fact we didn't see the response that we had hoped for. The peak on the left is the number of engineers that received degrees in the United States in the 1950s on a per capita basis. This is the immediate aftermath of World War II, when all the people who had been in the service returned home and under the GI Bill got a university education. Look at how tall that peak is. 1960, too soon to have been influenced by Sputnik, right? The launch was in late 1957. This is just three years later. College students had chosen their major, and you all know that once you make that major choice, even if you're a freshman or a sophomore, you never waver from that. So by 1960, <laughs> by 1960, their plans had pretty well been fixed, and so there wasn't a significant increase. But look at 1970. Isn't that interesting? The number of engineers that were graduated in the United States on a per capita basis in 1970 was only about 5% higher than it had been in 1960. 5% growth, not on an annual basis, not compounded, 5% total. Well, if we think back on the past few decades, the number of engineers educated in the United States and the number of scientists, particularly physical scientists, didn't stay stagnant. But this suggests that it actually wasn't Sputnik that inspired large numbers of people to study science and engineering, despite popular lore, which has almost become mythology, despite press reports to the contrary. What happened? How many of you remember this era, this, it, 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 uh, what this image is associated with? Good, none of the students, because this is from 1973, right? An organization called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, in late 1973, took action in response to a complicated series of political considerations, including a war in the Middle East, but they reduced the output of oil that they were producing, and they simultaneously, in a concerted fashion, increased price. This had the effect of causing widespread panic in the United States. I remember this era very well. I was a middle schooler at this point in time, and I can remember it with my parents, coming home from a family gathering on a Sunday afternoon, and if a flag went up in front of a gas station, meaning they had gasoline for sale and it was available, you would jump right in and wait in line because you never knew when gas would be available, and my father needed to fill up the car to be able to get to work throughout the course of the week. There was odd even rationing based on your license plate number that took place at this point in time. So this had a tremendous impact, in some ways even more significant than, than the Sputnik launch, on the engineering and scientific community and on society as a whole. Now, if we go back and look at engineering numbers where I started and look at engineering numbers in the 1960s and 1970s and compare those to what happened in the immediate aftermath of the first OPEC price action and a subsequent action in the late 1970s, what do you see? Right, look at this. 1975, slight increase over 1970. 1980, significant increase. 1985, huge increase in the number of engineers and scientists who were receiving university degrees in this country. So is this a Sputnik moment? I don't think so. I think this is actually an energy moment. It was the immediacy of the initial energy crisis that spurred us to action. It wasn't academics saying you must study engineering and science because it's good for you. It wasn't our government leaders saying you must study engineering and science because our nation needs you. It was this immediate crisis that clearly had as a possible solution technologies that could be developed by the next generations of engineers and scientists who spurred us to action. Now, if we take a slightly, slightly broader look and look at the price of oil over a four-decade span, you see that through the 1960s into the early 1970s, the price of oil was essentially flat. This is in constant dollar terms, inflation-adjusted constant dollar terms. 
I think, in 2006 prices. 1973, we see the first significant price increase. 1979, the second significant price increase. If we overlay the number of people getting degrees in engineering in this country at that time, look at how nicely those curves line up. Where was the Sputnik moment in the 1960s? Small bump in the late 60s. Where is the energy moment? Four years after the first oil price shock, early enough to have affected the major choice of college students around the country, we see a significant increase in the number of engineers graduating in this country. This is great, but what happened there? All right? The price of oil fell, the number of people studying technology fell significantly. All right. Now, if we blow that up and look at it in a little bit more detail, what do we see? This is the past 25 years of history of the number of people studying engineering and physical science in this country. Right? I look at this and say, wow, this is pretty sobering. 8% of the students getting university degrees in engineering in the mid-1980s at its peak, down to just about 4%. 4% now. If they're not studying engineering, what are they doing? Well, there are other branches of science that have seen an increase in enrollments, but you know what else has seen an increase in enrollments? Parks, recreation, leisure, and fitness studies. Now, I like to run, I like to hike, I like the outdoors as much as the next guy, but if you take this and extrapolate it forward, those trends will cross in 2027, right? I think it's a matter of perspective. I think it's a matter of balance. I think this is something that we should be concerned about. This is why the president's talking about the importance of this being a Sputnik moment. So why do I care? I oversee an engineering school. We educate engineers. Of course I have a vested interest in this. But why should you care? If you're not an engineering major, if you're not studying engineering, if you're not a practicing engineer, why is this important to you? Well, let's take a look at what has and hasn't changed over the past 50 years. This picture, I'm taking us back to energy now. This is the energy supply in the United States in 1960. What do you see? The three biggest wedges, coal, natural gas, and oil. Finite fossil fuel reserves providing over 90% of the energy consumed in the United States. Move forward, not quite 50 years later, but the most recent data I could get for 2008, does that look significantly different to you? Yes, okay, there's a light blue wedge that's a little bit larger because the nuclear industry was just coming online in 1960. The first of the nuclear power plants were just beginning to produce power. But otherwise, not a lot has changed. Right. But what's happening right now? Right. What's happening right now in world oil markets? If we look at the price of petroleum, and now I don't cut off the end of the curve that I didn't show you earlier, but we look at the price of oil over the past three years, you all know this if you're paying at the pump putting gasoline in your car. The price of oil has spiked to levels not seen since the mid-1970s, in fact levels significantly higher than the late 1970s. Now, wait a minute, I just showed you a few slides back engineering enrollments, engineering degrees, and I said they've been coming down significantly for the past 25 years, and in fact, if we extrapolate that trend forward, by 2027, we're gonna be graduating more people in this country with degrees in parks, recreation, leisure, and fitness studies than in engineering. But earlier I had said, it's the energy crisis that spurred us to action the first time. It's the energy crisis that captured the public's attention. It was the energy crisis that motivated study of science, engineering, and math. If that's the case, shouldn't we be seeing another spike? Well, actually, if you look at what's happening, not just here at Dartmouth, but around the country, things, in fact, do seem to be changing. I am hearing from my colleagues that this year, and in the sophomore and junior classes, there is 30 to 50% growth in engineering enrollments in the US. In fact, at the Thayer School this year, as long as everyone does well spring term, <laughs> We may well graduate the largest class of engineering students at Dartmouth in the 140-something year history of the school. That's an immediate and dramatic transformation. And it's not just in the US. Internationally, enrollments remain and interests remain extremely high. All right. Why is this important? Here we go. I didn't know what Bill Hellman was going to say. Founders, right? The founders of energy startups. 
Do we care about energy? Energy has been very much in the news. We need to find ways to efficiently extract the remaining fossil fuel resources and do it at minimum damage to the environment. We need to find ways to develop sustainable sources of energy from biofuels, capture the wind, harvest the sun. We need to find ways to make nuclear energy safe and efficient. We need to find ways to capture geothermal energy. We need to make our energy consuming devices more efficient. Who's going to do that? Well, who, here's what the financial markets are investing in. Here's what people like Bill Hellman are investing in. People who are starting companies in the energy space, overwhelmingly engineers. And so why should you care? If you care about this, right? If you care about a clean energy future, if you care about efficient, clean, and safe extraction of resources, if you care about sustainability and protecting the environment, I would argue that it is not just enough to produce scientists. We need to produce engineers. We need to produce more engineers than we have in the past. What did I say at the beginning about the Sputnik moment? Three things that were critical. Infrastructure, investment, and education. We have the infrastructure in this country. We have the education. We have the educational system, and students are responding. What we need is the investment to make this a reality. I'll stop there. I think it's lunch break. Thanks very much.